Tell me a little bit about your position now. I am the Senior Vice President for Curriculum and Content at Sesame Workshop, uh, the creators of Sesame Street. As the Director of Curriculum and Content, what is it that you do? So my responsibility is to um, oversee the development of our whole child curriculum, which actually then guides content creation um, for uh, content for, for children across all of our media platforms. So Sesame uh, is a curriculum-driven television show, or it's a curriculum-driven brand, I should say, because we're more than just a television show. And um, we revise our curriculum on an annual basis. So it's my responsibility to identify what are the key critical issues in children's lives, uh, be it an academic issue or a social emotional issue or a health issue or even a societal issue. Uh, so that we could then address it from a child development point of view and we could integrate it into our whole child curriculum. The Sesame Street shows that, that our children watch do not happen by accident then. They're very well planned. Oh, no, it's a, it's a whole year in advance um, of our development. So at first it starts with what is the curriculum focus for the season? Um, and it, it cuts across, as I, as I mentioned, um, all of the content areas that would represent a whole child curriculum. So you, there's a whole year in, in advance for, for the shows? Yes, it's about a year of preparation uh, as we prepare for the next new season of, of Sesame Street. And while we are uh, driven by what we call a whole child curriculum, which is dealing with all aspects of, of child development, we do then hone in on what we call a curriculum focus because we've identified a, a current need for today's children. So once we've identified that need, we start with an advisory uh, curriculum seminar and bringing in the people who have research uh, in this topic uh, around young children because we are trying to meet the needs of, of preschool children. Um, and then um, it's a, a, a year of uh, working with the writers and creating the, the scripts. But, and my staff and I review the content to make sure that um, the content that's created is uh, driving that particular curriculum goal uh, and it's in, done in an age appropriate way uh, so that young children understand the, the key lesson of that either story or song or uh, uh, skit. Um, but the other part of what we do is research. We are very much engaged in what we call formative research. And so as we're developing either um, a story on Sesame Street or an interactive game, uh, whatever the content is, we want to bring it to the expert. And that's the children themselves. So we all have expertise. But the real expert in this particular case is the child because if they're not interested in watching or playing the game or they're not understanding the key messages, then we have failed. The child hasn't failed. We failed in delivering the content to the child. What is self-regulation? What is regulation? And why is it one of those critical skills? Self-regulation are those um, cognitive skills that help children control their thoughts, their emotions, and their behaviors. And these are the underlying skills that help children learn. So when we talk to teachers, kindergarten teachers, how, how, do, you, how do parents best prepare their children for kindergarten? What they're looking for is if the child has what we call these self-regulation skills, because they want a child to come to the classroom eager to learn have the ability to follow directions, to be good listeners, to have the opportunity to regulate their emotions because think about the day in the life of a child in school. There's lots of transitions and young children uh, have a tough time with transitions. So there's an emotional component to this. They may, they may not want to uh, transition to an, another activity because they're focused on a particular activity. So how do you get them to control these emotions and also what we call delay gratification? So I really want to get to the playground, but first we have to go th for this music lesson. So that's delaying the gratification of what you really want to do, go play in the playground. 
So these skills help children focus their attention, but also there's something else called um, the ability to shift attention. So here's an example. If a child is doing a sorting task, they may be able to sort things by color. But you could take those same objects and say to the child, now I want you to forget the color and now focus on the shape of the object. And that's what we call a big word, cognitive flexibility. How do you forget the color and now focus on the shape? That ability to shift your attention, focus from one thing to another, is a critical skill to help children uh, prepare for school, but also school achievement. I wanted to talk about one show in particular. Um, the R is for regulation with Cookie Monster. Can you tell me a little bit about that show and what went into, into that? Well, as a way of emphasizing our self-regulation curriculum, we decided to focus on Cookie Monster. And you may be asking, why Cookie Monster? Well, Cookie Monster is a very impulsive character. And he's driven by cookies. That's his main reward. So we wanted to be able to teach him how to regulate this desire and to say, Cookie, you can't have the cookie now, but you could have the cookie later. Uh, and so what are some of the strategies to help Cookie Monster? So we created a storyline um, where he wanted to join the Cookie Connoisseur Club. And we knew this was going to be a, a tough club for him to join because uh, as a cookie connoisseur, you have to look at the cookie and appreciate um, the, 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 the visual uh, uh, depiction of the cookie, making sure that they're, they're, the cookie's perfect. Um, and then you have to smell the cookie, so, so the aroma of the cookie. And then to make sure that the cookie tastes good, it's delicious, you need to take just a nibble. Now, think about each of these steps and how Cookie Monster has to regulate his behavior, has to regulate his emotions, and he has to be very conscious of what he's doing. So for the first step, we tell him that, um, well, as you're looking at the cookie to help you not gobble it up because that's what he wants to do the moment he sees the cookie is to think that the cookie is not a cookie which is the first strategy so if a child really wants something you have to pretend that it, that chocolate chip cookie isn't a chocolate chip cookie so in this particular case we said it's a yo-yo that worked sort of but he then ate it up um, and that's okay because the message we're trying to tell parents and children is that you're going to fail. It's what you do with the failure, right? You learn through these mistakes and you want to have perseverance. And there's not just one type of strategy that's going to work all the time. So the next step is when he has to smell the cookie, we use another strategy for him to, uh, uh, um, Chris, who's also on Sesame Street, gave him his stinky hiking book boot. So it's like, okay, don't really, you have to smell the cookie, but I really want you to smell this other uh, odor to help you. That didn't work either. So uh, he tries again. And now for the next strategy is his ability to just take a little bit of, of a bite. But what helped him in this particular case is he knew this was the last step for him to get that biggest reward, the, to, to become a member of this club. And so that reward outweighed the desire to gobble up that cookie as he, as he usually would. So to have that plan in mind, have that goal in mind, was the strategy for him to hold on to and to use in order to get the ultimate reward. And he does get into the connoisseur, the cookie connoisseur club. Tips for parents, for parents who are trying to teach this self-regulation, what kinds of things they, can they do or what, how should they approach this with their kids? Yeah. I think the first thing for, for parents to, to realize is that children have a range of, of emotions. Um, you, and you can have multiple feelings uh, at the same time. So I think it's really important for parents to validate the feelings that the child has. So if they're frustrated or they're disappointed or they're unhappy, 
uh, to put a label because that label really helps the child know that the adult in their lives has an understanding of what they're feeling because sometimes they don't have the label. So when you give them a label, it's sort of like, oh, that's what I'm feeling. So let's say the child is frustrated. Um, one thing we, we ask parents to do is, and this is, this is a strategy for everyone, not just to children, to pause, to stop and pause, and to take a couple of deep breaths, what we call belly breathing. So slowly breathe in through your nose and exhale with your mouth. And so we have children, uh, you could have them lie down, they could put a little um, a stuffed animal on their belly so that they could actually see their belly going up and down. Could you talk to me about belly breathing, some tips? Belly breathing is a, is a great strategy to help children calm down and regulate their emotions because when they're in the moment of their emotional state, their frustration or uh, sadness or anger, they really can't hear anything or they can't shift their attention away uh, from that emotional state. So belly breathing is a great uh, exercise for all of us to engage in. So we can stop for that moment, take a couple of deep breaths and for children to really take in from their bellies. So another tip is maybe to have a child lie down with a stuffed animal and have them focus on the stuffed animal going up and down as their belly goes up and, and down. Another strategy is what we call self-talk. So if you're trying to stay focused on a task, um, so you're trying to learn how to ride a bike and you're, and you're giving up, but to just remind yourself, I can do this, I can do this. And children talk to themselves a lot. What's beautiful about children is that when they talk to themselves, it's out loud. When we talk to ourselves, it's internal. So that's another key for parents because if listen to your child because they are narrating how they're, how they're feeling or what's going on in their mind because they are engaged in the self-talk. But to use self-talk as a motivator or as a way to focus. So if they're doing a puzzle, you know, not to give up. And you're gonna hear me talk about not giving up because we want to help children learn what we call task persistence. So that is a key skill that we want children not to give up in the face of failure but to figure out what did I learn from this mistake and how do I, how can I get better so that they are successful in, in um, accomplishing uh, the, the, the task at hand or the plan that they, they have. Tell me about how the cookie connoisseur piece ends. What, what is the ultimate reward, resolution? He becomes a member of the cookie connoisseur club, which then gives him access to a range of an, an unbelievable array of, of cookies. Once you're in this club, uh, you get to see how everyone is making all different kinds of cookies and he will be the test, the, the taste tester of, of all of these cookies. What's the lesson for kids here when they're watching? What, what's the takeaway for them? I think the big takeaway, and I'm really proud of the work that we've done with Cookie Monster, is for children to see themselves in Cookie Monster. Um, as I said, his personality, he's, a, he's a, uh, a very impulsive character because it's hard for him to focus because he's very distracted by the cookies that he may see. And sometimes he sees cookies and things that aren't really cookies because Cookie Monster eats a range of, of, of items, as we all know. And I think what's important for children to, to learn from Cookie is that there are many different strategies to help them learn these self-regulation skills. And Cookie does his best to learn these skills. Even in the face of failure, he doesn't give up. And for parents to watch Sesame Street along with their children, because yes, it's a children's show, but we have a human cast, an adult human cast, and we portray them as the parents of our characters. And we're equipping them with the language and the strategies so that they're helping our characters and we're helping parents because we're modeling for them how they could implement these strategies in those everyday moments of their, of their child's life. 
As kids are starting to develop these self-regulation skills, what's the implication? Do, do we see that, that they have more success in school, that they have those basics? Yes, self-regulation skills are critical for children's success in, in school because it does help them to focus their attention. It does help them to plan and, and to, um, and later on in life, we have to have, we're, we're teaching children study habits, right? And they have to prioritize and they have to figure out how to allocate their time. These self-regulation skills allow them to engage in successful study habits. Um, task persistence. So the idea of, of not giving up and to have a positive mindset. You know, it's very, um, it's very sad to hear children say, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at science. And where are they getting this information from? Because it's how you perceive yourself. So you need to start reframing that and say, I can do math, I can do science, but you have to put the effort into it. So we all can learn math and science. It's our um, uh, perception of whether or not we can do it or we're willing to place that effort where it needs to be placed. These self-regulation skills help with that. So it helps not only with academic success, but also um, uh, credit card debt, because let's not be impulsive shoppers. <laughs> um, it helps with diet and exercise, because what do you have to do? You have to stay focused with your exercise routine, and you have gotta delay the gratification. You can't be eating all those sugary items. So it really is, um, they're, they're very important skills for our overall health and, and, and development. And the more self-regulated we are, the better our society will, will, will be. Uh, at, you know, at, at, at large. At what age? The most um, uh, critical development where we see the largest increase in learning these skills is during the preschool years. And that is related to brain development. So as the prefrontal cortex uh, is being developed and these, are, these skills need to be modeled in order to be learned. So these are not innate skills. Someone needs to show the children what these strategies are, and we need to practice these strategies in order to learn these strategies. It's sort of like our toolbox. So with Cookie Monster, the one strategy didn't work, and the second strategy didn't work, and that's okay because maybe the third strategy will work. So we wanna make sure that we have a range of these strategies so that um, children can use them um, as, as, as they need them. Um, but it's, the preschool years are critical, but they continue to develop because, as we know, the brain isn't fully developed until the early 20s, which, you know, we, t we talk about adolescence on how adolescents engage in risky behaviors because the prefrontal cortex of their brain is not completely developed. If we could talk about the science um, behind it. When we decided to focus on self-regulation, the first thing that we do is we go to the social scientists to find out who is doing research on how to teach these strategies to children and what are the effective um, strategies. So the strategies that we know from scientific research that actually have impact in developing these self-regulation skills but and how these self-regulation skills are linked to outcome measures such as academic skills or social emotional development or, or health outcomes. So our model is to work with these social scientists. So we bring them together and we have what we call a curriculum seminar. And at that seminar, they share their empirical evidence with us with preschoolers, because once we want to make sure that their research uh, is applicable to teaching these strategies to preschoolers. Um, and so it's based on this empirical evidence um, that we, and then to make sure that when we create the content that we got it right, we have the advisors read the scripts or um, see a first pass of an interactive digital game to make sure that we uh, actually portray the strategy in an accurate way. Could you uh, just cite some of the, the research studies that went into this particular show? Stephanie Carlton, University of, of um, Minnesota, Stephanie Jones, Harvard, um, 
Deb Leinbarger, who has a curriculum called Tools of the Mind. And the, person, the, the two people who do research for her are uh, Clancy Blair and Adele Diamond. So I believe I gave you the article zero to three. So you'll see a lot of those citations in that, in that article. Oh, and the other person is um, the guy from Columbia who we all, um, who did the marshmallow test. If you could tell me a little bit about the, yes. the study after the show. I mentioned how Sesame does all of this preparation to make sure that we have identified a goal or a curriculum focus and then to use the uh, best practices from evidence based research and then create, creating the content for, for children. So in the case of self-regulation, we um, were for, very fortunate that a researcher, Deb Leinbarger, um, took our content, our show content, and then um, showed it to children to see, well, okay, if your goal was to teach these strategies to help children develop these self-regulation strategies, how successful were you? What, did you really have impact? So she did this pre-post uh, study, so based on the marshmallow test. So uh, we know that children, if you give them a marshmallow and we tell them to, if you could wait until the experimenter comes back, they'll, they'll be rewarded with two marshmallows. Uh, but she did a variation of that because not every child likes marshmallows. So she first asked the children what their, what their favorite snack is, be it goldfish or pretzels or chocolate bar or a marshmallow. And she did the experiment to find out how long they could delay the gratification of eating the, um, the special treat. Did they wait for the experimenter to come back? Um, so once she had that baseline, she then exposed them to all of the Sesame Street content that was focused on teaching children, modeling these strategies, and teaching these children uh, self-regulation strategies. And she found out that the children who were exposed to, and it was an um, experimental group and a control group, of course, and the children who were exposed to the Sesame Street content, they were able to delay their gratification up to four minutes, which is huge in the lives of preschoolers to wait four minutes for um, a special treat that we have, that she determined what is their sort of like pain point staring at the goldfish or the marshmallow and then waiting until the experiment came out. Can they do that? And there were very specific strategies that of course we, we, we modeled for the, for the children. And what, what would those be? So the strategies that um, are uh, very successful for preschool children to delay that gratification, uh, that, that reward. Um, so if you're staring at a piece of chocolate, um, one way to distract yourself is to do something else. So maybe you'll start singing a song. So get your mind off of that um, piece of chocolate or marshmallow or whatever you, you want to be eating. Um, another one is we tell children is to put a picture frame around it and say, this really isn't a chocolate bar. This is a picture of a chocolate bar. So once again, this cognitive, you're shifting your attention. You're turning something from a desirable um, object to an undesirable. Well, it's not desirable anymore because it's only a picture of, 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 a, of a chocolate bar. Another one is to just like forget that even is existing and go over and do something else. So play with a, a stuffed animal. So you're getting, once again, you're shifting your attention from that hot item to something else to make it cold. That's really not there. I'm going to do a puzzle or I'm going to go read a book. Um, so these are kinds of strategies that we need to have children know that they're available so that they could use them when they need to shift their attention away from what they really want to, you can't have it yet. Your education and your expertise. I have a doctorate in developmental and child psychology. So it's a PhD. Where did you get your your PhD? Uh, my PhD is from the University of Kansas. Master's and undergrad? Um, master's is also at the University of Kansas, and undergrad is uh, Bachelor's uh, of Arts in Psychology at Douglas College, Rutgers University.